real men do care about how they look and you should too uh hey guys it's uh, steve i want to <laughs> welcome you to another episode of the evolve podcast welcome to the evolve podcast a podcast about disrupting your life to spark new evolution evolve your body evolve your mind evolve your soul and evolve your tribe and now it's time to disrupt And with that, folks, we want to welcome you to another episode of the Evolve Podcast. Uh, joining me today from Oberlin, Ohio, is the most interesting man that I know. Sounds like you're drinking tea there, Miles. W. Miles Riley. Got your beautiful nice, tea mug there. Welcome. Uh, nice mint green tea. Nice. I've got a little bit of uh, tea by my side. Uh, and in the mountains of Utah, I am Steve Cutler. Guys, I'm really excited today. Uh, because we have a returning guest joining us again. Tanner Guzzi uh, is coming back on. And uh, it, you, you may know Tanner because he is all over uh, social media, putting out just some amazing content. And he's also the author of The Appearance of Power, which uh, we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, Tanner, I think I've read your book now three times. It's just one of those That's books awesome. that you can go back to and get so much. Uh, for those of our listeners that did not hear our first episode, uh, go check out episode 14 of the Evolve podcast, uh, which incidentally is still one of our top shows uh, to this day. So Tanner Guzzi, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back on. I'm excited to get to hang out with you again and Miles to get to spend a, uh, some new time with you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed the first one and I was excited, but I forgot why I had to miss it, but I got you this time. Well, yeah, you were, uh, so before you jumped on, Tanner and I were talking about how he's been running around, taking his kids to different places today. And uh, last time we had Tanner on, that's what you were doing. You were taking your son somewhere. Soccer. Uh, so we had our good friend Nick Meekum join, join us. I, I think it was soccer. Yeah, that's about yeah. all he does, right? Yeah, that's what he does, <laughs> soccer. Yeah. Well, yeah, Tanner, tell lives, us a little bit about, it. yeah. Tanner, tell our listeners a little bit about what you do today and, and uh, you know, what is your, what's your life and your lifestyle and your business? Cool. Okay. So I have a very, uh, a very different, very interesting job in that I talk to men about clothing and appearance, grooming and all of that. And a lot of guys assume that that means I'm a stylist, uh, that I will tell you what the latest trends are and tell you where to go buy them and, and, you know, kind of like treat you like a mannequin where I dress you according to what the latest trends are. And my approach is, is very much different. Um, I help men understand the psychological relationship that they should have with their appearance and how it helps us meet the different needs that we have both with our own sense of self and the way that we relate with other people and how clothing is a tool of communication. And it's one that you need to develop the skill set, just like you learned how to read and to write. Uh, yeah, every man needs to learn how to use his clothing to be able to communicate to the rest of the world and how to communicate to himself his value, his goals, his aspirations, what he belongs to, what he doesn't belong to, all of these other things. And so basically I help men open up their relationships, their own sense of identity by tackling it with an angle that they've never considered before by using their, their clothing and their appearance. And it's really impactful. It's amazing how much this can make a difference when somebody actually starts to pay attention to their appearance. When you think about the world, right, and what we're looking at when you go out into nature and how beautiful it is, um, I mean, you don't go out into nature hoping to find a really ugly spot that you can go meditate in or that you can go hike in, right? You're going to go out to the place that's going to be beautiful. And yet somehow we disconnect. There's this cognitive dissonance, I believe, between our own appearance and how we show up in the day to day. And that somehow if I just look sloppy that I'm going to feel okay, but there's just no way that that's going to be the case. Right. Right. I, I love how in your process, and you talk about this quite a bit in the book where you're helping people to get to the heart of it, uh, who they are and that it, the style expression, right. Is more so about an authentic expression from who they are as an individual. Um, talk our listeners through just a little bit about what does that methodology look like to help people understand who they are uh, and and where that style expression is coming from. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of become an on running an ongoing joke, especially with my uh, my clients that interact with each other in the group dynamic and all of that, where I end up getting to know the guys that I work with better than even their wives do. Uh, I, my process is asking them questions that 
sadly for most men, we never get asked, you know, what, how would you like your eulogy to, to read? What would you like that to say? What are your main aspirations? How do you want your grandchildren to understand what your legacy is? And these may be questions that we ask ourselves in passing, but to have actually somebody sit down and take the time to ask you those questions. And then for me, the follow-up is always, how does your clothing help you accomplish those goals? And most guys just go, dude, I have never, ever thought that my clothing even would help me accomplish those goals. And as soon as they sit with that question for more than 30 seconds, they start to go, oh, oh, okay. There's a lot that my clothing can do that it's either doing positively for that right now or that it's negating that right now because I'm not dressing as well as I could be. And so the first step is always really diving into who they are, who they want to be. And then from there, it's how do we use your clothing to help facilitate that and help to, to suss that out. And so you always have to start with the man at his core, whereas most fashion, most clothing, most stylists take the opposite approach. You are a carbon copy. You are a literal mannequin that they will say, this is what the men's magazines, or this is what the designers, or this is what they're doing in Hollywood. And let's just transpose that onto you. And you become this vehicle for some other person to be able to express themselves. And so it's a complete inversion of what it should be. I think that's extremely interesting because that model is the big hat, no cattle people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Great definition. And and I have to admit, you know, the first time we were talking about interviewing, you know, you know, the first thing I thought was stylist. And then once I watched some of your material, I thought, oh, okay, that was a, I did a 180. I was like, oh, he goes deeper than that. He goes deeper than that. It's very important that people understand you're not a stylist because just based on those questions alone, I can almost see somebody having a strange look on their face after you ask those questions, then talk about how they look in response to those questions and all of a sudden now you've got this thinking going on wow what yeah. what can i do so i'll give you i'll give you a good example of one of the clients that i was working with yesterday um as one of our calls we were going through and looking at a few different photos and i'm asking him what resonates and what doesn't resonate with a particular style and there's one where there's a gentleman that's wearing a really good green sport coat and he's got this wool turtleneck on my client says, I do not like that turtleneck. And he kind of has a little bit of, uh, of emotion in his voice, which for me is a really good cue that I need to dive deeper into that. And it's like, okay, tell me why. And he says, I don't know. It just feels, it feels confining. And so it took us about five minutes, but it got to the point where for him, what that turtleneck represented, because it was something that not only was up on his neck, but it also meant that once he put that on, he was committed to wear that all day. For him, that represented the feeling of being trapped. Oh, and so he needs to dress wow. in a way where yeah. he can add or remove layers because it gives him a sense of control over his himself and over his environment. And so yeah. being able to add or remove layers throughout the day, even if he doesn't do it, psychologically, the fact that he feels like he has the ability to do that helps him feel like he's open, that he's in control of his circumstances, whereas the other makes him feel trapped and he's going to feel cagey all day if he wears something like a turtleneck where he's going to feel much more open to what's going on if he wears something else. Stylists don't talk about stuff like that. You're not going to get that if you go talk to a shop or at Nordstrom right. or you go look yeah. at what the latest fashion blog is. Yeah. That's a, that, well, what a fascinating story that that's how he felt, but far too often we don't even recognize this. And I, I it, that makes me think of a conversation I had yesterday with someone, um, you know, I don't know if you've read the book, uh, nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg, but no. phenomenal book talking about how to communicate with each other. Right. Pardon me. Got a cough here. And, um, this gentleman was saying, well, I don't even know how to communicate that way. I like, I get the concepts, I get the principles, but I don't even know how to understand my emotion. I, is that a common problem you see when you're working with men that they don't know how to understand their own emotions? Totally, totally. And that's even something that, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. And even just within the last year with my own self-development, my own self-work, I've realized how little I've been able to recognize my own emotions and what's been fascinating is I get better and better at recognizing my emotions, at learning to not be afraid of them, but learning how to sit with them, learning how to fully process as opposed to suppress them, how much better my understanding of the psychological impact of image and appearance are. Like these two are very, very correlated. And so it doesn't surprise me that men have this general disdain for appearance and aesthetics that very much mirrors the same disdain that we have for emotion and expression because the two go hand in hand. 
Yeah, you, uh, I mean, you set me up perfectly for my next question. <laughs> and and I, it's top of mind for me because I'm sure it's top of mind for you. Uh, you tweeted something today that really resonated with me. You said, we always see emotional control as the ability to hold feelings back when we need to. When we feel an emotion building up oh, and you're in a place where it's appropriate to let it flow, can you do that? Are you truly in control if it stops, or if it stops rather than starts to flow? I absolutely love the way you put that. The emotional control is really not just about the stopper, right? It's a faucet. Can you can you turn it on? Can you turn it off? Can you let it flow with a great consistency or you know a, a little trickle? That's part of what I think emotional control is. Talk a little bit more about um, why this concept is so important for men in particular. Well, I think that we've really been, we've had it hammered into us that healthy masculinity, especially post-World War I and post-World War II, is you don't talk about emotions and it's your job to hold back everything. And, um, you know, if the, the only time that it's appropriate to cry is at your dad's funeral or when your dog dies or that yeah. your yeah. job as the head of the household is to make sure that you're the rock for everybody's emotional storm to be able to go around and be around. And for a lot of us, for me, what that, what that translated into is that experiencing emotions is bad. Experiencing emotions is bad, whether mm -hmm. that's those that have the potential for destruction, like anger or fear, but even things like grief or sadness, or even to some extent, like how many of us grew up in households where to be a kid, to be a good kid meant that you were quiet. And so if you were too exuberant or too loud or too goofy, that that was something that received some level of punishment or rejection because of how your parents were like. The full range of emotions yeah. is something that we as men have been constantly told, or at least post 20th century, have, have been told that to be a man is to not experience that full, that full range. And the reality is, is that to be a man is to experience the full range, but to have the capacity to go from, I'm experiencing my, my big emotions when they're very big and I know what to do with them then, or I have the ability to compartmentalize them and not experience them when it's not in my best interest or my family's best interest or somebody else's best interest for me to be able to do that. So one of the hard things that I've learned about myself, I learned about this this morning, my, uh, my brother, who was 18 months younger than I am, he, he took his life back in June. Now, obviously, a very emotional experience for me and my family. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm working on learning how to do is even just feel where my, where my emotions feel in my body, being able to recognize where they feel in my body. Yeah, and this morning, nice. because of that and because of some other things that, that we're dealing with with our own little family, I was feeling this, this overwhelming sense of grief. And I could feel it like down in my gut. And I had this very strong desire to really just let it go and to just cry, like to get all that energy out. Like it felt like it was yeah. stoppered in there and it was, and it was yeah. like, it was a, like, I was a pressure cooker and I had, I needed to get it out and I couldn't, I could not let down whatever that barrier was to be able to get that, that emotion out. And so now it's back in and it's churning in there. And so this tweet was all based on this realization this morning of I've learned how to stop my emotion when I don't want it to flow. I have no idea how to turn it on and let it flow when it's necessary for that to happen so that I can process it in a mature and in a masculine way too. So I'm in, I'm in the middle of trying to tackle all of this. I think it's important to differentiate expressing the emotion as, as opposed to like when people say men don't feel emotion. I, I think men feel everything, the wide range. It's expressing it and then not expressing it, it becomes something really strange in your body. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. very important to recognize that because men feel it. You know, we did, I don't think as a human being that, that you don't feel it. I think it just runs in your body. How you choose to express it or if you are allowed to express it creates the psychosis or the, 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 the neuroticism, the being neurotic or however, it, not allowing it to come out. So I think there's a, we should make a distinction between that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, In fact, I think one of the you most, bring up a, you go ahead, Steve. Oh, go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I, one of the most fascinating things I've read in my own journey with understanding emotion in the last year um, is a book called The Body Keeps the Store. Have either of you heard of that or read that one? I, wow. I've, I've heard of it and I've seen excerpts, but I, Guys, it's on my it's list. It's incredible because it talks about how 
Miles, exactly what you were saying. Like we feel emotions. And even if we don't consciously feel them, which is my case, like I had no idea what guilt feels like, or in up until six months ago, I wouldn't have been able to say what grief feels like because there was this subconscious suppression of it, but emotions yeah. have to go somewhere. And if we right. don't process them and we don't consciously do that, then sadly, what so many of us do is we bury them in, and our bodies manifest it. It keeps the score of that. And right. so, so much of what we see as far as like autoimmune disorders or um, the physical manifestations of things like depression or anxiety or all these other things are actually a result of the fact that our emotions have to go somewhere. And the only thing they can do is declare mutiny on our bodies if we don't right. learn how to process them the way that they should be. Right. Yeah. And I like how you were talking about that, you know, when you weren't sure what what that would look like when you couldn't figure out how to unstop that and let that emotion come out, uh, that it just goes back in and it keeps churning. And I think one of the biggest problems men in particular get uh, run into, one of the challenges is when we feel an emotion and we don't know how to express it in a healthy way, it will go back into our bodies. It'll mm -hmm. churn and it may show up in a different way. And then we go to that symptom and we say, oh, I've got to fix that, that particular problem. But it's like the, anything in the physical realm the symptom isn't the problem, right? And oftentimes there's an upstream or a downstream effect that has happened that's caused us to get symptomatic. So this is a crucial skill that takes years, if not decades, for men to identify how to identify the emotion first and foremost. And then once I identify it, where do I go from here? Uh, talk a little bit about the process that you're going through as you're identifying these emotions. I think it's beautiful that you say, hey, I felt this this morning. I opened myself up to it and then Ah, nothing happened. So it mm -hmm. goes back in. But I think that opening up is, is like the first step. But what, what's the process that you're going through to understand yourself more? So for me, there's two things that I'm doing right now that have been really interesting. One is whenever I feel something, um, I guess you can say there's three, because one is the first time I feel something, rather than putting on my stoic face and saying, I don't feel it, I will communicate with my wife that it's like, I'm feeling this, especially because mm -hmm. I don't know how this is for you guys. But for me, I've basically spent the last 11 years of my marriage gaslighting my wife, not intentionally, but like she knows when I'm feeling something. And then I will say, no, nah, I'm not feeling that when I really am. Yeah. But, and so I'm gaslighting myself as much as I'm doing it to her. And so right. even that, just that first step of, no, I'm really like, I'm feeling bad. And today it was, I don't even know what this emotion is. And so the first thing is I will communicate it. So she knows that where I am and she can help me determine like, okay, we're good right now. Like the kids are good. Everything's good. So like sit with this for 10 minutes and see if you can figure out what it is. Or it's like, okay, if not, then let's get through doing these things. Like you got your calls today and then let's try, try and come back into, you know, and so there's a little bit of that communication that comes with it. The second thing is then sitting with it and trying to identify where I feel it in my body and what it actually feels like. And yeah. what's interesting so for me is I start to recognize like, shapes or colors or that it sits in different places or things like that. And so for now, the third aspect of that is I will actually sit down and I will draw what that visualization looks I like. Love that. And then even like yes. write down all the different things that are yep. associated with it. And like, so for example, for me, when I feel anger, it's right in my sternum and it feels this, it feels like this glowing ember that's in there. And it's almost like it's pulsating and it feels like there's red and there's orange and there's yellow with it and it's hot. And sometimes it feels like, how is nobody else like seeing that my chest is glowing because it feels <laughs> that strong, right? And yeah, dude, a year yeah. ago, if you would have asked me that, it's like, oh, that's ridiculous. But it's like, what do you mean? Like, where do I feel it? Or what is it like? What does it look like or anything? And so being able to go through that process of making sure that I'm okay to feel it, diving into my body to trying to find out where it is, and then extricating it by drawing it and writing about it feels like I'm getting to know myself. This is a weird comparison, but it's almost like when you're dating somebody and you're getting to know them, it almost feels like that same process of like, I'm dating myself, yeah. but I'm trying to figure out who I really am and how I manifest things and what my own reality is. And so that's, that's the process I'm currently working through with it. What a cool process. I do very much uh, something very similar. I draw, I write, I will, you know, try and put it somewhere into the physical realm where I can then get it out of me and I can look at it because I think once you get it out of you, you can, you can pay attention to it. I remember one of the first times that I started to uh, wake up to the emotion. Uh, we were in Lake Tahoe and there was a group of us. We were out on this climb and we're climbing, right? And we're about two and a half pitches up or about two pitches up, which is a pitch is the a rope length for those that don't understand oh, okay. climbing. 
And so we're about two rope lengths up. So uh, safe to say we're probably about six to 700 feet off of the ground at this point. And it's me and my partner, my climbing partner at the time. And I'm just hanging there. He's gotten to the top and he's belaying me to on this final pitch. And I put the backpack on that had our shoes because we were going to get to the top and then you have to hike back down, right? Um, and I come out of this little corner, this little bookend dehedral area, backpack shifts, and I feel for the first time in my life what terror is. I had no way of describing it before this time. I didn't even know what it was. I just looked down, and all of a sudden, the ground was five feet from me, and then it was a thousand feet from me. And it just kept doing this thing, and this terror started to fill my body. I pulled back into where I had been sitting, belaying him, and we just communicated back and forth. I need a few minutes. So at a certain point, I did what you, I figured out instinctively to do what you're talking about. I had to ask myself, where am I feeling this in my body? What is this emotion? And at the time, I didn't realize what it was, that it was terror. It was, I felt fear, and I understood fear to a certain degree. Then I got to the point where I said, okay, now what? What am I going to do? And this is where my ego kicked in because my ego said, okay, buddy, you got three choices. Choice number one, you're going to fall and die, which is probably not going to happen because you're roped up, your partner's at the top, we're good. Less than a choice, choice two, as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Choice number two is you're going to have to get rescued off of this. And my ego jumped in and said, no way. And so choice three was, all right, well, regardless of what the emotion is, you got to start moving forward. So I started climbing and I got to the top. What a shocking and amazing experience that was at the time to recognize that emotion. But I think that your analogy of dating yourself is a beautiful analogy because while I understood terror in that moment, it wasn't until years later that I started to understand the nuances of several other emotions that came up. You know, we, we, we have this emotional vocab vocabulary that's so small, especially as men. And I think that's part of the challenge. Like you talked about, we're, we're, we're taught to bury it and to push it down. And so we don't develop this breadth of a vocabulary when it comes to emotions. Um, go a little bit deeper, if you would, on this, on the drawing concept and, you know, getting this out onto the paper so that you could see it. Like, I know what my process looks like and what it feels like, but I love that that's a part of your process. How does that, how does that work for you mechanistically? So um, I have a, I actually have a little drawing app that I use on my iPad that normally I just use for work, um, that I use it when I'm drawing out things or okay. doing stuff for webinars or presentations. And what I'll do is I will, I'll use that same one. And I've got like a little subfolder that's basically now just like emotions. Um, and I will draw, I'll draw a torso or a head or legs or wherever it is that I feel that emotion. And then I will try and draw out what it is. So like, for example, Another one that I can feel is my intelligence. And I, I will draw the back of the head and then it almost feels like I have these, these like um, iron laurel leaves, like a crown of laurel leaves, but it's inside my skull. And so I'll take the time to like find the color that yeah. feels like it's the right color that resonates with that. And then I'll draw that out. Yeah. And then I'll write down intelligence in that same color. And then I'll just go through and I will write anything that comes to mind about like from my own internal parts perspective, my intelligence is the thing that everything else looks up to. And they want that guy to always be the thing that's in charge. And like all of these other things that come with it, and I'll just write it down what its own self-perception is or what the other emotions or the other parts of me, what their perception of it is, what it fears, what its, what its goals are, what it's accomplishing and all of this. And it's all drawn out. And then what's cool is I can go back. And as I experience that emotion again, I experience that different part of me again, and then there's always more that I can add to it. So I'm, I'm trying to, to flesh this out even further and, and understand it even more. Yeah, that is, that's amazing. It, it's a really layered and nuanced approach to figuring yourself out along the way. And I, and I love that. Um, I want to want to kind of piggyback on that. We go to a post that you had made recently that um, I, I thought was both courageous and um, very, um, probably a very difficult thing to do in the social space. When you said that uh, you and your family, you're dealing with some things, and as you referenced earlier, your brother passing away uh, via suicide, that you're, you're kind of circling the wagons and you're, you're getting uh, your family into this state where you guys are looking internally 
We're trying to reconnect uh, to, or excuse me, to connect, re uh, reflect, reevaluate those types of things. Um, on, on the podcast, well, oftentimes we've called it going into the woodshed. This is a, a term that I stole from Miles because a lot of jazz musicians will go into the woodshed where they need to go deep, right? They're, they go to the back, uh, the woodshed behind the house, and they just stay there until they figure out what the, what the problem or what the issue is. I mean, talk a little bit about the circling the wagons or woodshed process that you're going through. Uh, obviously, it's not just, okay, I'm digging deep to understand my emotions, but there's got to be a more to it of figuring out um, this next phase or this next stage of life. What is that looking like for you? I think one of the, one of the more interesting, interesting things about it, and even one of the hardest things to admit about it, again, because of the space that we're in, is, in fact, I'm planning on doing maybe a reel or something else related to this, but I think that a lot of us have a tendency to, whatever it is that we do to take care of ourselves, uh, we, we want to do more of it because we think that doing more of that is what will get us to a better position. And so for me, especially okay. for, the, for the last like five years, um, so much of my handling stresses and difficulties and things like that has been taking on new projects, finding new challenges, um, whether that's in like, I started learning a cello a year and a half ago, or it may be in the physical space of uh, boxing or then doing a half Ironman or then doing a Spartan Beast or all of these other things. And like, one of the things that my wife and I were joking about this last night is like, guys, I've been, I've been addicted to strength training to the point where like, it's my kid's birthday and everybody's up having breakfast that morning and I'm out in the garage lifting and saying, you know, let's wait to start until after I get my session in. Like it, yeah, it became something yeah. where it was so consistent. And so it's, I became dependent on it. I became totally reliant on it. And so as we started to, to tackle all of this stuff, um, I remember calling my, uh, my coach, Matt Reynolds, and basically just saying like, like, here's everything that I'm dealing with. I had a session where I was doing something simple like Bulgarian split squats and I couldn't get my heart rate to calm down for half an hour. I'm lying on the gym floor and I can't get my heart rate to calm down. Like, I don't think, mm. I don't think I'm okay. And I need to take a different approach. And basically, and this is how funny, because this is even where I am. Man, you're digging everything out of me today. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I basically said, I need permission because I won't give it to myself. So I need permission from you as like my coach and my expert for me to take some time off. And he's like, dude, absolutely. Like this is, this is necessary. And he, you know, we had this conversation about how strength takes a long time to build and a long time to lose and all of this. So kind of like, but I haven't touched the weights in the last... I think I've touched the weights maybe three times in the last three months, whereas for eight years prior mm -hmm. to that, I'd never gone more than a week while I was on vacation without hitting the gym at some point. And so part of circling the wagons is realizing that some of the things that I've done that are healthy, I'm not saying that, that, that strength training or um, endurance training or developing new skill sets and, and learning new things, none of those things are bad. But if I just continue to overly rely on those to the exclusion of what I need on the other side, then I'm just going to keep hitting my head against the wall. And so I've had to take a break from the things that are in my comfort zone. I mean, even this, I was talking to, I'm working with a couple of different therapists. It sounds dirty just saying that out, but that's the reality of it is I'm not doing this on my own. Yeah. And one of them, well, when or should we, were, we, right? No, right? So yeah. one of them, when we were talking, she, uh, she said, um, I need, I want you to get out of your comfort zone. And she talks about like skydiving or doing like cold plunging or all these other things. I'm like, okay, great. Let's do that. Like, let's, and then it took me a minute. It's like, yeah, yeah. that's all in my comfort zone. Like I will go <laughs> sit in the ice bath five days a week. Like the things that are normally out of everybody else's comfort zone are in my comfort zone. And so for me, getting out of my comfort zone is like being able to sit in the backyard while the house is a mess and just learn to just shut up and be okay with that instead of that I have to be productive cool. in order to be a good person. Or it's, I'm going to go to a hip hop class and try to dance and express emotions through my body instead of being very like reserved and self-restrained and dignified and all of that. And so these are the ways that I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone. I'm trying to do a whole lot less like work and grind and trying to do a whole lot more of relax and play and feel and it's hard, but that's, I'm, I'm trying to, to get this contrary because I've overdone it on the, in this other direction. 
what a what a cool journey and i i love how that you and your coach and your therapist have recognized that what your therapy is what your approach is 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 going to be different than somebody else because like you mm -hmm. If you told me, hey, you got to go cold plunge, I'd be like, all right, what time right now are we doing mm -hmm. that? Let's go. Yep. Um, you know, let's go. Let's go take on that challenge. Let's go uh, climb that next mountain. Let's go over that next obstacle. But um, my biggest challenge, I, I'm really resonating with what you're saying, uh, was a year or so ago, I got to the point where I looked around. And I said, OK, I've got to admit that I am addicted to growth and development. I am addicted to success. I'm addicted to pushing. Mm -hmm. And what would happen if I just became a recovering overachiever, right? <laughs> I love that term. <laughs> this, yeah, and so that's what I started to name myself is I, I would tell people, I'm like, well, I'm a recovering overachiever. So really I only have one goal in life and everything else I'm looking at is play and mm -hmm. fun right now. And it totally shifted my mindset, my perspective in a way that once I started to layer in other goals, it was, uh, I'd, I'd find myself going, falling back into that and I say, no, no, okay, these things are not that important. You need to make sure that you have that, that play and that fun uh, into it. I, I'd love to hear from you, Tanner, as you're going through and you're, you're pulling back, right, from this drive drive and you're, you're stepping into this concept of um, less overachievement and more enjoyment, where do you notice the resistance inside of your body? Because we all have it. I know I feel it. I'm curious where you feel that. What does that resistance look like or feel like to you? That's a great question. I don't know if I've consciously sat and thought with that, but one thing that I have kind of offhandedly noticed more over the last few months is I have this kind of nervous energy of like my legs twitch like they do when you're a kid and you're bouncing all over the place or like even right yeah. now i've got my feet crossed and one of my feet is doing this like there's just this constant movement and flow yeah and i okay. think some of that translates into even like i mean here's here's one of the hard things that i've learned about myself is that when i feel like i am not when I, when I don't recognize my own value, whether it's because um, my wife isn't giving me the validation or the affection that I would like, or um, I'm not seeing the results or the progress that I like, one of the things that I do to cope with that is I will go do something productive, like I'll go tackle this project in my son's room that I haven't done for a while, or I will like go fold the laundry or go do something else. And it's been kind of sad to realize that so much of my productivity is not rooted in a desire to serve the people I love so much as it is a way to soothe myself into believing that yes, I'm still a good person. Because oh, how can I not be a good yeah. person if I'm still being productive and I'm still doing these things? And so the resistance that I'm finding is actually more in the, dude, just, just stop. Just, just stop. You don't have to, you don't have to go clean out the shed or go reorganize the basement or go do x y or z in order to be a good person you can just exist you can just you can just be here and just exist and you don't have to constantly be proving your value to everyone else or even to yourself like just shut up for a minute and just exist and be okay with that and know that the world isn't going to implode and that everybody isn't going to abandon you because you stop being productive for a minute yeah, that's pretty impactful. And I, I can relate to that 100%. I keep, uh, I've got a little um, coin, challenge coin. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you call them, but it says Memento Mori on it. Oh, yeah. And essentially on the backside, you could leave life right now. Let that determine what, uh, what to do, say, and think. And years ago, um, I had a mentor teach me uh, death meditation. It's a, which is a Buddhist practice where you focus on the concept of death. Mm -hmm. um, and I got really deep into this. I, I read uh, a couple of books by the Dalai Lama where they talk, he talks about the power of death and how when we understand that, that you know, life could end today, it could end tomorrow, that then it creates this sense of well, what we do right now matters. But at the same time, it also helps us to come to a realization that like if I were to pass away today, that my kids, my wife would probably remember me throughout their life, but at moments, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to live their life and they don't remember me for moments. And then in a generation or two, I'm going to be forgotten. Gone. And so yeah. sometimes looking at it from that perspective makes me think, ah, okay, well, this, this, this stuff that I'm worried about really doesn't matter. 
Like I'm doing it because I love these people. I'm doing it to provide pleasure for myself or enjoyment. It's not that important. And yeah. it's, it's funny when I started to realize that. And you would think that, okay, this meditation on death thing, that's weird, right? That right, macabre or nihilistic people. or whatever else. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but it has been one of the most powerful tools uh, and, and forms of meditation that I've employed over the years because it does create this sense of happiness. I can look around and say, ah, oh, but I'm here right now. In fact, the other day, I'm dealing with this head cold thing. And uh, I walked into the kitchen and I said to my wife, God, I really don't, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. You know, I feel uh, bummed out. I'm, my head is giving me trouble. I'm not focusing. I'm not able to get stuff done. And she looks at me and she goes, but enjoy the comforts of home. That's what's great about being yep. sick is look at our house, enjoy the comforts of home. And I looked at her, I smiled and I said, thank you. And I just went back to the bed and laid down and said, yeah, I'm sick. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I enjoyed the comforts of home. Right? Yeah. Far yeah. too often we put too much pressure on it. Uh, on, on ourselves. I, so those are the, so you, I, you, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Oh, no, go for it. Go for it. Well, it's, it's interesting listening to this um, and, and totally understanding it, but also, you know, when we speak of emotions, we motion generally mean to be these large expressions. And I, and I think sometimes we forget the subtlety of the micro emotions the things that don't yeah. necessarily explode mm -hmm. or implode, they're, they're really subtle. They're usually from generations growing up and parents. And these expressions certainly like, they get glossed over because they're really subtle and nuanced and you can't get them. So all these other types of behaviors happen with these subtle emotions and our ability or inability to really feel the subtle emotions, if that makes any sense. Yeah, to me, so it sounds like what, what you're saying is that if we don't, if we don't recognize and experience and, and go through all the subtle emotions, then it builds and builds and builds until it has to get to the big emotions. No, not that it has to build. They're just, they're just these subtle emotions and we take behaviors and place them on those subtle emotions because, and we don't recognize we recognize the behavior, but we don't recognize the subtle emotion that's triggering the behavior. Mm -hmm. So we come up with all these other types of behaviors that feel like there's just the general way we're doing things. And they're really not. They're expressions of some other emotions. And once we get in touch with those subtle emotions, we can make a, a more informed choice of the habit that we've used to layer over those emotions. That makes a lot of sense. And I've done a lot of work in this in terms of with me, and, and you know, having full range of my expressions and things like that. Like recognize that everything we do or everything we feel, there's a thing that we do with that feeling. And sometimes it could be counter to the actual emotion, the thing that we do. And it's, it's really important to recognize that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think to, to me, it's almost like if you, we all recognize, so I, I take it back to like food and nutrition, right? We all recognize uh, fat and we recognize sugar and we recognize the flavor of certain things. But then as you become more educated and your palate expands, you're able to recognize different yeah. flavors, different spices, right? And you become more nuanced in, in your ability to right. recognize the food that's going into your mouth. If I just that's a great example. McDonald's every day, I'm just going to understand salt and fat and sugar and that's it. Yeah. But as I go into beautiful food and I look at the nuance of the, the way that this food looks and the way that it hits the different parts of my tongue, my palate expands. And I think emotional intelligence is, is really the same way that yeah. we understand and we, we develop a layered approach to mm -hmm. recognizing emotion yeah. and then also in our response to that emotion uh, as well. Taylor, there's there's a there's a connection. There's a link or excuse me, Tanner. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why I said Taylor. That was the weirdest thing. It's a, anyway, it's a TA. It's easy. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Tanner, there, uh, there's a connection between emotion and how we dress and how we show up. And mm -hmm. we've talked about this before. Um, you, in your coaching, and you talk about this a lot in your book, about the, the, it's an expression of who you are as an individual, right? You're either uh, a rugged, refined, rakish, or a combination of these three things. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of nuance to it, too. And while you're not a stylist that says, here's the new trend, 
you do pay attention to and you teach people about the differences and the nuances of the fit and the color and the way that those things all come together. And so I think that there's, there, there's a connection between the emotion and how we show up. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you walk us through either how you're coaching people in this nuanced approach so that they feel like they're showing up more or like, uh, is, it a, is it a process where they, like the guy the other day, he's wearing the turtleneck and he says, mm -hmm. no, I don't like that because of this emotion so that that educates the process or is it cyclical or does it go one way, both ways? How does that work for you? It's, it's very cyclical. There's a lot of back and forth that goes with it because um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of contextual cues that come in with things. There's a lot of personal experiences that come in with things. And again, you can think about it from, from the same perspective of language um, where let's take a word like, um, like bloody, okay? Here in the United States, you say that word and it doesn't have the same connotation that it does if you were to say that over in England. And it doesn't have the same right. connotation that it would if you were to say that in Australia. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's so many. And so one little word, one set of sounds, that's just it's assuming that we're English speakers. You know, you get people that speak other languages and that may yeah. sound like yeah. it's similar to another word that's spoken in another language. And so that carries a separate meaning and a separate connotation and all of that. And so one of the things that's super crucial that I do with each of my clients is we have to dive into what the context is, what their personal relationship with different aesthetics are, what the cultural relationship with different aesthetics are, because I may have two guys that want to communicate the same things as far as like self-respect, dignity, authority, credibility, friendliness, openness. Those are, you know, the pretty standard kind of things that men would like to communicate with their clothing. Yeah. But if you have one guy who runs a landscaping business in Houston and another guy who runs a tech company in San Francisco and another guy who is a student in, at Princeton, like they may want to communicate the same things, but the clothing that they're going to choose in order to be able to express that to other people in or, or in order to be able to reinforce that in themselves is going to be very different. And that's just based on what they do for a living or where they live, let alone the fact that they have their own personal histories of, you know, I had this one, I don't know, this one teacher in elementary school that that guy always wore these really loud suits and he was a jerk. And so I hate loud clothes and I hate loud <laughs> colors because it makes me think of somebody being domineering and being fake and being, and it's like, yeah. that's valid. Like, I'm not going to tell you that, that you don't, that you shouldn't feel that way. I'm going to tell you, okay, so then what are the workarounds? What are the other tools in the toolkit that we need to use besides color to be able to express what you want to express? So there, there has to be a ton of give and take. There has to be a lot of openness not only with me to be able to communicate, but for my clients to be able to like dive into, why do I have these visceral reactions to the fact that people dress a certain way and it makes me feel something? Because it's only when we suss all that out that we can actually find what we're working with and then build something that's workable for them. And you really through this whole process, helping people to become a better version of who they are as men, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a more true expression of who they are as men. Yep. Um, and I want to tap into this idea of masculinity and power because I, your, your book called The Appearance of Power, um, you know, thinking about the nuances of that word, that can become a, a negative uh, connotation to some people depending on how they see it. Mm -hmm. But really power is, um, I, I, we all want that to some degree, right? right? And for me, I've got a tattoo on my back that power is one of those things that is tattooed there because I don't, I'm not looking for power over other people. No. To me, power is influence. It's the ability to influence people for good. And so I look at the idea of power as something that, yeah, that's the force I can use for good. Now, if I don't, then I, I obviously I need to re reconnect and understand what my values are. But let, let's dig into this power concept and this masculinity concept. Um, talk a little bit more about this and how, how you're working with clients to help them to, to tap into the masculinity and power that they have. Yeah, I think one of the sad things about especially our current kind of like capitalist, post-capitalist marks, like we have this like oppressor oppressed zero sum perspective on power and power is almost always seen through the lens of like either other people have power over me or I have, other, I have power over other people, but there's always this wrestle for power. Right. Yeah. Good point. And I don't, I, there certainly is that element of power. I'm not going to be naive and think that there aren't people that have power over me or there aren't like I have power over my children, period. You know, like that's just the reality of it. But 
that's not the only way power exists and power can exist in its own kind of independence. And you can even think about it as like, for example, my wife choosing to completely, we're, we're, we're a pretty traditional family. Um, I'm the only one who works. She stays home full time with the kids and she submitted herself to my, my economic ability to provide for her but she's yeah. willingly chosen to do that. And so that's, that's an act of power even on her part where she's not, I'm not taking that from her, but she's willingly submitted to, do, to doing that. And so even that is an act of power on her part. And so I think you're right. A lot of times power is a scary word when it really doesn't need to be. And a lot of men, especially because we've grown up in a culture that maligns masculinity or treats it like it's toxic, or you know, it may be that even we're in kind of like a revenge of the nerd culture. And so, our elites are these guys who resented the jocks and you know the the films that we grew up with were the guys who had yeah. power were the bad guys and we celebrate the underdogs and all that and so i think sadly a lot of men are even afraid of their own desire to attain some level of power because we see it again as power equals oppression and that's not the case power is about the ability to impact your own life to the extent that you can based on your own free will your own free agency and i think that that's something that everybody should have to the greatest extent possible and clothing is one of the tools it's certainly not the only tool and i wouldn't even say it's a primary tool it's secondary at best tertiary is even more likely but it is a tool and a necessary tool to help you understand your own relationship with yourself your own idea of what the, the ideal version of you is how you interact with other people what authentic authenticity looks like what attachment looks like these other variables and so it is a tool to help us develop our own our own power to be able to dictate what we want out of our own lives you just gave me an idea yeah, it just gave me an idea i think i'm going to play with you know i have I, I collect coffee mugs and every morning when i wake up i literally stand there consciously and say which mug do i want to use today i don't think i've ever done that with clothing mm -hmm. you know sometimes i'll put on really nice clothes and Sometimes I won't care, you know, it's a kind of a mix, but it, it's never really been at this kind of sustained conscious effort to just ask myself, how am I feeling today? How, how do I feel? Okay, and then open the closet and pick something and look at no, yes, maybe possibly this combination. I'm going with that. I don't think, think I've- what, Think about what a sense of power that is, is okay, what am I feeling today? What do I want to feel? Who is it that I'm interacting with? And what would I like to communicate with them so that I feel more confident or that I'm more persuasive or influential? And look at this yeah. tool that I have that's totally laid out in front of me that gives yeah. me more of the capacity to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. My only fear is that it gives you I'll have nothing to match my emotions. <laughs> this, this is where you got to hire me to help you figure that out, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it's time to go go shopping with Tanner. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, uh, really, it's about developing power over yourself, your own internal universe. Because yeah. if you, you're going to have power over other people, you have to have power over yourself. Totally. And you know, the, I, I, I'm not opposed to this concept of power over other people, or like you talked about, your wife submitting a certain amount of power um in in this relationship because that's what great relationships are we submit certain power to another person um and that's that's how we become synergistic in our relationship mm -hmm. um i want to come back to what you were just saying earlier about this concept of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. i've heard that so much and i don't know why it's there um, i mean i have my theories as to why that has been promoted at such a high level um, but it, it almost seems like this concept of we need to subjugate men mm -hmm. so that they don't stand up for the good. That, at least that's my perspective. I think that there are so many things in this world that are, when you look at the rise and fall of any great empire, right? We're, we're, we're on that precipice where yep. we're, we're, we're moving towards a major fall. Right. Um, we are not strong people. We are not people that uh, are, are pushing ourselves forward. We have moved into this easy state of, oh, I want this food, let me hit it on the app and it gets delivered to me and I can get fat by doing that, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think that there's a subjugation piece to this where if somebody is in power, the easiest way to subjugate people is get them fat, happy, um, and lazy, right? So fat them and stupid. Man. And so talk a little bit about this concept of toxic masculinity, because I would imagine that in your particular uh, realm that you work in, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're doing this with it, right? You're button heads directly with this concept of toxic masculinity. 
Yeah, and I would say that this is one of the things that actually distinguishes me from a lot of the other guys who are in the, in the space that I am, whether that's on different social media platforms like Twitter or Instagram or even speaking at the events that I do is I think one of the problems is that I don't want to be anti-toxic masculinity. I want to be pro-positive masculinity. And so um, I think that, that one of the things that's crucial for us is rather than um, being on the back foot and constantly defending and saying that masculinity isn't toxic or constantly being reactive and letting these people who are opposed to masculinity being the ones that set the tone and set the stage that we will be much, much more effective. We will individually be much more happy and we will collectively win more hearts and minds by there needs to be an element of that. Like you need to have some level of defense, but by putting the majority of our energy into promoting positive masculinity, for me, that's yeah, fatherhood, that's faith, that's beauty, that's art, that's aesthetics, that's music and culture, that's brotherhood and fraternity, that's strength and physicality, that's all of these other things. And so um, that's what I'm constantly striving for and, and constantly stri striving to make my messages, not being reactive to the people that hate us, but instead cultivating a pro-masculine culture that is so apparently beautiful and wonderful and glorious that men can't help but want to be part of it yeah that's, that's an evolved sense of masculinity really put that that's an evolved yeah, sense of but, masculinity but i think that's the true piece of it right mm -hmm. i mean that's really it well, when you think about it, i mean go, go back in go time ahead, i'm sorry great society go ahead, right? Steve. if you think about the great societies the the strongest men were the men that had that balance they were spiritually balanced they were emotionally balanced they had physical strength right um you know some of these great societies in history they didn't delineate between these different strengths that men had like if i'm physically strong i also need to make myself mentally strong if i am physically and mentally strong but i don't have a connection to my higher power and to that deeper spiritual sense that I'm not truly leaning into what it means to be a man. Right. And so I, yeah, I, I agree to a certain degree, Miles, that it's a, it's in a more evolved way of looking at it, but I think it's the true way of looking at it. Well, and it I is the true way. We're unique in this, right? But we're, think about it from this. That. Think about it from this perspective. When you said the other cultures, you were talking about cultures that have stood for centuries. America yeah. is still very young. Very young. You know, that's why when, when people say things like when we talk about, you know, the developing the developing nations, you know, I, I think it's like an arrogant statement. Like it's almost as if it puts us in a position to say we've stopped. Right. We're we, already how many. Right. We, we are still evolving as yep. a powerful nation and we're relatively young. And if I think of toxic masculinity, there has been that and there's evolved masculinity. It's like sure, we're yeah. evolving into something. I loved, uh, I loved how Tanner phrased it. We're evolving into that, but to evolve to that, we are coming from a place where, to a degree, we've been pretty primitive. And we're moving towards this more enlightened type of masculinity, which I think is a wonderful thing. Yeah, and I would yeah, say that sadly yeah. where we kind of missed the boat on it is that we think that in order to eradicate toxic masculinity that means we have to eradicate masculinity as opposed right. to understanding that right if, if if we're even going to subscribe to the idea that it's toxic it's toxic because it's been overdeveloped in a one-dimensional way as opposed to right. yes. every equal part being developed so that they're fully fleshed out and that they have the counterbalance for each other right and if we if you if you take what yeah. you said and add to our earlier conversations of men being stifled in their emotions and not knowing how to express emotions, we could easily see how we could get to toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because if the only thing yeah, you know how to do is rage, additive. that's it. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. And it's not that. And I love how you phrased your anger is, is a bad thing, right? This has to be additive. If, if you're going to become a true version, the evolved version of who you are as a man, it's got to be additive. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that's a common theme in, in what you put out, and I know you talk about this in your book, you talk about it in all your social posts, is this running joke, I guess is the way I look at it, of real men don't care how they look, right? <laughs> um, and then you'll show these pictures of people throughout all history that 
really care about how they look and that there's a reason behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, as I call it, that joke that, that you put out there consistently and why that is, I, I don't know, it, go, go deep on that one. It's such I a fun it, little meme. And I think men need to. Yeah. yeah, it's a fun little meme. And it's, it's funny because it's something that I even picked up on back in my early days of blogging, where I would be like checking my WordPress stats. And all of a sudden, I would have like 3000 hits from some random forum that I'd never heard of. And I'd go and I'd see mm -hmm. somebody had posted something linked me back to my site. And you scroll through like all the different threads on this forum. And like, you get an average of maybe like, three to four pages of comments. And then on the bangers, you get like maybe seven to eight pages worth of comments. And then on mine, it's like 30 pages worth of comments because there's this yeah. very emotional, visceral, reaction. it really pisses off a certain demographic of men to tell them that there's a place for aesthetics when it comes to masculinity. There's a lot mm. of guys who really, really dive into this idea of if you're going to be a, a true red blooded masculine man, you shouldn't care what you look like. That's effeminate, that's gay, that's whatever other pejorative from whatever other decade they want to right. throw at it. And the irony is, like you said, you go throughout history, you go across culture, men have always cared. They've always cared. And you look at yep. any class of men, the warriors, the shamans, the bureaucrats, the kings, the peasants, the laborers, the merchants, it doesn't matter. Men have always understood that their appearance was a way for them to deepen their attachment to the world around them and also to better understand and express their own authenticity and their own individuality. And I think that that's the real irony of that statement is when you think about real men don't care how they look, what's rooted in that is both of those psychological needs of attachment and authenticity, because it depends on this collective agreement of who real men are and that it's desirable to be a real man. So there's that attachment right there of, I don't want sure. other people yeah. to see me not as a real man. And so if I dress like I look like I care about myself then other men will reject me and not see me as a real man. But then also this authenticity of, I also really just want to be a real man because I'm, I'm wired this way. I'm biologically designed to be this way. And so if I'm doing this, then I'm, at, I'm somehow neglecting or rejecting myself. And so I think that this is why there's such an emotional reaction to this. But what they, they don't realize is that their antipathy for clothing is still very much caring about clothing and its impact on yes. them and how they fit in with the world. Yeah. There, there is nuance and there is emotion and they actually do mm -hmm. care, even though very they might so. be expressing it. And, and oftentimes I think that, that uh, anger, that pushback comes because there is a natural desire for us to care. It is hardwired in us. I truly believe this to value and appreciate beauty in yep. all of its forms, right? Yep. I don't think that God created us to say, go out there and just love ugly stuff, right? right. <laughs> That's why the world is beautiful. That's why we're drawn to flowers and men are drawn to beautiful uh, women. And we just uh, like, you, you see something and your eyes pop over and you say, wow, that's gorgeous, right? Beauty we're doesn't have to have any ability to itself. Yeah, there's massive value just in beauty in and of itself. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the most important things that uh, I think I, I, I try to do on a regular basis is either be in nature or go to a place uh, like an art gallery or the symphony and just sit and enjoy beauty. Mm -hmm. And I remember years and years ago going to the symphony for the first time and thinking, what do I do? Like, how do I, <laughs> okay, I got to put my phone away. Like, what right. do I do? I don't even know what they're doing down here. And then uh -huh. at a certain point, it just clicked. And I thought, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Just sit here and enjoy. Just sit and move. Be surrounded by Feel it. Feel it. Yeah, be surrounded by it. Enjoy the fact that all of the balcony is, uh, you, you know, covered in gold leaf. Enjoy the fact that here we are. I'm in my tux. My wife is in her uh, uh, dress. We're, there's there's beauty all around us, and this music is just like resonating. Now, when I go and I sit, it just immediately when I sit down, my, my eyes brighten, my smile goes on, and I just start to feel that music, and I feel everything in a totally different way. I think that's a major piece to being a man. Mm -hmm. And it is understanding that aesthetics, it, whether it's in the way we look or the things that we consume, it really matters. 100%. Well, Tanner, we're coming up on our time here, and I want to run through just a quick rapid fire. Um, and so in our Wait. rapid fire, what we do is. Before we do rapid fire, can I ask one go? question? Hit me. I got a All question. Right, here you go. This is Miles' favorite And the question thing. is. As soon as we go rapid fire, he's got to jump right in. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't figure out where to fit this in. 
talk because we were talking about comfort zones earlier, and I want to know if in, in, in your experience where you always interrupt to go in. <laughs> what you do <laughs> with what you do, have you ever had a woman come to you who's trying to get outside of her comfort zone? So she mm. wants to work with what you do, inevitably throws you out of your comfort zone because you're accustomed to working with men. I think the most oh, frequent DM I get is, is there somebody who does what you do, but does it for women? Oh, <laughs> like okay. right. so consistently. And honestly, I could probably five X my income. If I, if I worked with women instead of working uh -huh. with men or in addition to working with men, but I've tried this with a couple of different women. Um, uh -huh. And what I've found is it really is like trying to teach a fish to fly or a bird to swim. Like we think that the, that they're the same because it's clothing or because it's aesthetics, but everything about it is so different. And so it would take somebody, I, I, there certainly is a need for somebody to be able to understand the deep psychological manifestation of women's relationship with clothing. That's where men right. and women are the, are the same. There's a psychological component to it. It has to do with aesthetics, attachment, and authenticity. But that's about where it ends. And so, so yeah. yeah, I, uh, I would love, I would love to find a counterpart that could figure it out for women because it's, it's just as necessary for them as it is for us. Yeah. Cause I was thinking since you work on such a, for also an emotional level, emotional intelligence and psychological, but I'm going to emphasize the emotional that it would seem like women, you know, trying to just change up something or get out of their comfort zone would readily come to you mm -hmm. and, uh, and let you dictate to them since they're the ones trying to get out of their comfort zone. Yep. And a yeah. lot of them do. And sadly, I currently don't have anything to be able to offer them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe right. one day. All right, Tanner. So let's jump into the rapid fire. Still with our rapid fire. It's just one word or one sentence uh, in, in response to the question. So okay. uh, let's talk disruption. How do you disrupt your life in order to spark new growth? Um, I, I look for contraries. You want me to elaborate? Like that. Sure. Yeah, go okay. for it. Basically, it's like we, I stop doing the things that I'm good at and I try to find the opposite and get good at those two. Very cool. What a, what a, uh, a bold thing to do. Uh, oh, how do you book. personally tap into your creative power? I'm passive and I wait for it to ask me to tap into it. <laughs> Ooh, waiting for it to come up. That's a good uh -huh. way to go. Now, personal evolution can be sometimes painful. How do you find the enjoyment in the process? That's a hard one because right now my personal evolution is very painful, probably more painful yeah. than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And I find enjoyment by looking, by looking back and see that I'm capable of transforming myself and becoming what I, who I want to become. Great perspective. Like I have yeah, a good track record that. of being able to change. Yeah. Yeah. Great perspective. Uh, last one in our rapid fire. We never really stop evolving. What do you do to show yourself compassion along the way? I'm learning to show myself compassion. Ask me that one again in a year. Sounds good. Yeah, that that's a tough one. And uh, I'll tell you that for me has been one of the hardest things that I've had to go through. And I can't say that I've mastered it, but I'm a lot better today than I was probably three years ago. That's encouraging. Um, with Tanner, yes, yeah, it does improve. And it is something that there's there's layers and there's nuances. Uh, in, in fact, one of the things that I found recently is that I started to lean into compassion. Um, I find that my overall being, my overall countenance changes because I don't, you know, we, 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 we tend to be self-critical. I think it's a protective mechanism, evolutionary mechanism where we look at ourselves and we start to go to that thing that we criticize. And yet we tend not to do that with other people. And compassion for me, the most basic definition of it that I had to start applying for myself is when I look at myself, when I'm looking historically, when I'm looking at my current self, or if I'm looking in the mirror, I've, I've learned that compassion is starting with what's good. Because, you know, your kids, when you show compassion to them, you, uh, you go with what's good. If they fall over, you're like, oh, hey, but you're trying, right? Or if there's somebody that you have power over in a leadership position and they screw up because they tried, uh, you say, yeah, but you, the, here's what you missed. Like, you really did these things well. 
And so that for me was like kind of the baseline and I've been working on, on bringing it up from there. Uh, well, Tanner, final question for you. This isn't a part of our rapid fire, but you know, at Evolve, we believe that uh, personal evolution and growth uh, happens by stacking one simple habit on top of another. Um, if you were to give our listeners one thing right now that you would love for them to develop as a habit, what's that one habit that you think is most impactful? Yeah, most impactful. Um, one that is very, very impactful for me right now is the habit of any time I think or feel something that I am, that I don't want to, or that I'm uncomfortable with, or that I'm afraid of, um, mm -hmm. to have the discipline to sit with it just for a minute instead of immediately shoving it out of sight and out of mind. Um, and learning that um, I can only get so much strength out of, out of doubling down on what's good. And I have to be able to sit with what's bad or what's scary to really become the, the evolved and the fully fleshed out man I want to be. Mm. Beautiful wow. perspective. Yeah, oftentimes it's in the winters of our life that we understand that the cold can be our best friend. And that, uh, you know, when we're in that darkness, we start to hear a lot more. Okay. Well, Tanner, um, it, it, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. And, and you know, what you bring to the table and what you do uh, has really impacted me. And I know you've impacted thousands, if not millions of other people uh, with the work that you do. So I want to tell you, thank you for um, I've had a, a, this what I feel like is kind of a cool, almost voyeuristic um, <laughs> way of, of sitting back and watching your growth and the content that you put out. I remember, I think I first got connected with your content when you were posting uh, these style type videos working, um, you know, at the suit store. Oh man, you, yeah, yeah. you've been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. watching that over the years and how your, how your voice has uh, continued to resonate with your growth and evolution, I, uh, I really appreciate that. And I think that uh, out of people that are creating content, you are so true and so authentic. Uh, and you just don't hide from uh, what's happening in your life and how you're feeling. So um, I really admire you for that. I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of this episode. And so I want to thank you again for for coming on. Uh, yeah, it was super enlightening. Yeah, thank it was really guys. enlightening. Yeah. Well, and on that note, folks, it is time for us to wrap up another episode of the Evolve Podcast. We want to thank Tanner Desi for coming on and my co-host, W. Miles Riley. Uh, Tanner, you're always creating great content. How do people get in touch with you? whether or not they just want to hear more, learn more, buy your book, or get coaching from you? What's the best place to find you? Okay, uh, easiest place to find me is masculine-style.com. Uh, it'll give you options as far as if you're interested in coaching, you can apply there, you can get onto the mailing list. Uh, the book is called The Appearance of Power. You can find it on Amazon or Audible if you're more of a listener. And then pretty active on social media, um, uh, Twitter, Instagram, if you're uh, of the younger demographic, I'm even on TikTok. And all of those Thank are you. at Tanner nice. Desi. And you can find me on there. Uh, my DMs are pretty open. Uh, I always love interacting with guys and being able to talk to different guys. And so if you follow me and you have something that, that piques your interest or you're interested in connecting, shoot me a DM and I'd love to talk to you guys. Awesome. And we'll link all of that in our show notes um, so that our listeners can, can get a hold of you. Uh, remember, folks, that it does take time and consistency to evolve. But first, you've got to disrupt. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve. And evolve. Thank you for listening to the Evolve Podcast. If you like this episode, share it with your friends. Follow us on Instagram at Evolve underscore cast and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting app. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve.